now I'm actually in good practice for, for doing the talk for you guys, um, which uh, it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to be here. I was originally going to speak about um, our work, uh, focusing on some of our work in human, but I think I'm just so excited about some of the results that we've been getting uh, in our recent collaborations with ICRASAT that I thought I'd actually change the emphasis a little bit and talk about the interplay uh, between crop genomics and uh, 3D genomics, um, which are, uh, and, and tell you a little bit about what we've been able to, uh, to accomplish in that space. And I also think that some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about in this, uh, in this talk, especially given that it's, you know, one of the first talks of the meeting, um, can hopefully give people a little bit of an introduction uh, into some of the problems of, uh, of crop genomics very generally. Okay, so if you are attempting to, hmm, I'm not sure the slide advancer is working. Uh, ah, okay. So if you're attempting to uh, assemble a genome, uh, any given genome, this is the human genome, has a set of chromosomes, long DNA molecules, and your goal is to sequence every single one of those chromosomes from one end to the other. That is the goal of any uh, genome sequencing project, crop sequencing, gene crop sequencing project, any other genome project. Uh, the big challenge, uh, unfortunately, is that whereas chromosomes are long, a chromosome can have hundreds of millions of uh, DNA letters, the individual sequence reads that are produced by contemporary uh, genome sequencing technologies are actually short. Uh, so the most common and inexpensive kinds of reads generated by Illumina sequencers may be only 100 or 200 letters long. So they're literally uh, less than a millionth of the size of a chromosome. You can get somewhat longer uh, reads using long read technologies, but still you're falling far, far short of the length of the chromosome. Because you cannot read an entire chromosome all at once, uh, you need strategy in order to assemble a genome. And, and one of the basic pieces of strategy is that you can tile individual reads to make contigs. There we have a whole bunch of aligned reads, and we're tiling them from one end to the other to generate a config. This would be completely fine if we were in a very, very simple microbe, for instance, that didn't have a complex genome structure. But in the kinds of genomes that we care about in this community, um, that's not the case. Because uh, after you've produced your contigs, eventually you run into repetitive elements uh, that are all over. Uh, all sorts of complex genomes are littered with these repetitive elements. And so your contigs assemble perfectly, but then you hit a repetitive element, and there's no way to tile over the repetitive element, because there may be uh, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of copies of that repetitive element. So your tiles sort of enter the repeat, but then there's, you know, 7,000 ways out, and you have to give up at that point. So what you end up with using these strategies generically is that you produce a set of contigs, and that is, that's kind of where you're at. So just to give you a sense, right, if you take, you know, one of the, uh, best extant short read assemblers uh, that exist today. You take the short reads, this is just for the human genome. What you want is the 46 long chromosomes of the human genome, or the 23 chromosomes of the human genome. Uh, and, and what these, uh, the software will do is produce, take your short reads and it'll produce about 100,000 short contigs. So you've got 100,000 puzzle pieces instead of the fully assembled puzzle. Now, one of the things that's actually interesting uh, about genomics in the last, um, especially the last decade or so, when the original International Human Genome Project was done, the goal was to actually get the end-to-end -end assembly of the chromosomes. <clears throat> in the last 10 years, it has become sort of widely thought that that is so difficult to do. The original Human Genome Project cost about $3 billion. Thought that that's actually so difficult to do that, you know, we should just get to this stage and then kind of leave it there. Um, and I think there's only a relatively uh, ambitious populations, re relatively ambitious subset of the genomics community that tries to take things further. Well, what would it take to take things further? Typically, if you actually want to get beyond this stage of having lots and lots of tiny little contigs in your genome and actually figure out what the chromosomes are, what people have traditionally done is they'll build these multi-institutional international consortia. This is where you start to spend, you know, millions, tens of millions of dollars even, right? And you generate many, many, many different data types all with the goal of saying, okay, this contig is on the same chromosome as that contig. This contig comes right before that contig. This contig comes right after that contig. This contig and that contig are pointed towards each other. And if you can eventually, you know, 
work your way through enough different data types like linkage maps and plasmid libraries and radiation hybridization maps and mate pair libraries and optical mapping and all those methods. You can work your way through all of those methods. You may be able to figure out, you know, how these 100,000 contigs are oriented with respect to one another. But what I want to tell you about is a different methodology uh, that we've developed based on a technique uh, that I and collaborators uh, created during uh, when I was in graduate school called High C. And I want to tell you a little bit about how this works and then tell you about how we've been applying it and, and in particular uh, how we've been able to apply it um, to some things that I think are, are, are very relevant to this community. The, the general idea of the High C method is it is a method for figuring out how the human genome is folded in 3D. Right, so the human genome is physically a long, or, or any genome is physically long. So take the example of the human genome is physically about two meters long. Right, if you take a typical crop genome, you know, some of the ones that we've been working on, you know, they can range from a meter long to several meters worth of DNA. Right, it's all folding up to fit inside the nucleus of a cell, which is only a few microns wide. Right, so it must be compacting in some sort of way. And the general idea of the HiC methodology is to figure out not just what the se sequence of bases in a genome is, but to actually be able to go beyond that and figure out how those bases are folded in 3D. So the way that we do this is we create maps showing how frequently bits of the genome are bumping into one another, right? That's, that's, the, whole, that's the whole business, right, is to figure out how frequently different bits of the human genome are bumping into one another. And the way that we do that is using a technique that I'll outline very, very briefly. So we start by taking our DNA and cross-linking it. So we're freezing everything in place. Then we cut the DNAs into little bits. And we use T4 DNA ligase to paste bits that are adjacent in 3D to one another. So I want you to pay attention to what happened here. Here we started with two bits of the genome that are close by in 3D, but they're actually on different molecules. We cut the genome into little bits, and then we paste bits that are adjacent in 3D to one another. So now what's happened is we started with two adjacent DNA molecules that are adjacent in space. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Uh, we started with two DNA molecules that are adjacent in space. And now what we have is actually a chimeric molecule, right? A 1D DNA sequence that encodes that adjacency. This is, to some extent, like taking a selfie, right? You take a selfie with your friend, right? Now you have a picture. It's you and your friend. You sort of have encoded the fact that you were in proximity to one another. This is sort of like a genome selfie, right? It's showing you that red bit of the genome and the blue bit of the genome, they were very, very, very close in the nucleus of one of the cells in which we've done an experiment. They bumped into each other. Anyway, then now you can use standard genome sequencing to, we're very, very good at DNA sequencing now, so you can reuse standard DNA sequencing to read off these, uh, these 1D sequences. We use typically Illumina sequencers. And we'll produce, you know, in any given map between hundreds of millions of these kind of bumping events that we measure, billions of these bumping events, right? And each one, you know, each one you can think of as a point. What, if you're representing this uh, data as a matrix, you can think of each one as, as just a position on the matrix. So you say, okay, the red bit of the genome is here, the blue bit of the genome is here. I saw the red next to the blue, so I'm going to put a little annotation over there to show that in one of my nuclei, I saw them bump into one another. Anyway, when you have hundreds of millions or billions of such data sets, you can produce maps that look, uh, that look roughly as follows. And I want to just highlight, this is, this is again from the human genome, but I want to highlight some of the features that are very clear here. So one thing is, uh, you can see that there's a little sort of low level of pink all over the place in the genome. I want, I want to actually highlight that you're, you're looking at something that's very, very zoomed out. But the highest resolutions at which we interrogate these um, they actually have more pixels than, let's say, if you look at Google Earth for images of the surface of the Earth, these have actually more pixels than that. So you're looking at a very, very, very zoomed out view of what one of these matrices looks like. One of the things you can see is that there's kind of pink everywhere because all bits of the genome have some chance of bumping into one another, and if you sequence deeply enough, you will see that. But there are some pairs of loci in the genome that have a very, very enhanced rate of bumping into one another. So in this particular case for the human genome, what's really striking is that there's 23 squares along the diagonal of this matrix. What are those 23 squares? Well, they're the 23 chromosomes. Because loci that are on the same chromosome, even if they're at opposite ends of the chromosome, are much more likely to bump into one another than loci that are in different chromosomes. 
So this is just the very first layer of structure that you see, for instance, when you look at the human genome, is you can see the individual chromosomes, and you can see that this bumping profile um, highlights, actually, individual chromosomes. And this already gives us a bit of a clue as to how this can be relevant. Because if I have two sequences that are on the same chromosome, they will bump into one another at a rate that is very, very highly enhanced. Now, these maps, as I mentioned, they have a lot of structure. So you can keep zooming in, and you see all sorts of additional structure. As you do that here, as we zoom in, you can see, again, even within a chromosome, positions that are very, very close on the chromosome are going to form lots and lots and lots of contacts. Positions that are far away on the chromosome will form fewer contacts. So here's one end of the chromosome, here's another end of the chromosome. They form relatively few contacts. They form more contacts than if you were on a totally different chromosome, but still fewer contacts than if you're very, very nearby on a chromosome. That's why you see this very bright diagonal, because loci that are nearby on the chromosome have a very enhanced contact frequency. A way of thinking about that is, you know, imagine that I had a chain gang. Right? I had a whole bunch of people, they're working in a prison, each one is chained to the next one. Right? And so then I decide I'm going to take pictures of prisoner 24601. Right? So I take a picture of prisoner 24601, but prisoner 24601 is handcuffed to prisoner 24602. So they're going to have a highly enhanced contact frequency. They're much, much more likely if I take a picture of 24601 to pick up 24602 or to pick up prisoner 24600. So you're seeing that for the, for the genome, for the human genome in this particular case, adjacent bases in the human genome have a very elevated contact frequency because if I pick up one of them, it's very likely to be in, in close proximity to its, its immediate neighbor uh, on the phosphate backbone of DNA. That's why you see this very, very bright diagonal on this chromosome and indeed on any chromosome in any organism in which you've done a successful high c experiment. Another way of thinking about it is that the likelihood that two bits of the genome are in contact is actually very, very high if they're close to one another and then declines slowly, 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 slowly as they move away from one another. So if I know, right, and here's the, this is sort of the critical idea, right, if I know how frequently two bits of the genome are in contact with one another, I can estimate things like, are they on the same chromosome? And if they are on the same chromosome, how far apart are they? That's, the, that's just the basic idea, right? And in some sense, this is very similar to things that we're very familiar with, you know, from our sort of social interactions, right? If I'm someone's next door neighbor, I will run into them very frequently. If I live on a completely different continent to someone, I will bump into them much less frequently, except at wonderful gatherings like this. So what we're doing is we're taking advantage of this notion, right, that if you are further apart in the genome, you're less likely to bump into one another. We can now measure these bump frequencies, and the idea is maybe we can use that information to take these hundreds of thousands of puzzle pieces and put them together. Now, I might add that as we've been working on this, actually other groups have been uh, working on this, and there have been a number of successes where people took this principle and they sort of did simple proofs of principle. They said, let's take a genome where we know how it is assembled, where we know the correct answer, we will cut it into little pieces, and we will show that we can put those pieces back in the right order. And this exercise has been done, actually, a whole bunch of times. It was done in human, uh, at mouse and Drosophila, actually, in 2013, in Arabidopsis, 2015, in Stickleback in 2016, in goat, actually, in 2016. I want to highlight, though, that in all of these cases, the answer was known, right? So it's kind of a proof of principle that you can get something like the known answer, but, but you already knew the answer, right? Th there was not a single case among these examples where chromosomes were actually being produced from small pieces where the answer wasn't already known. So these are exercises in a way, but important exercises and very valuable exercises. Um, and I specifically want to highlight um, Josh Burton and others, write a paper in Nature Biotechnology. We were working on this at that time, but they really, uh, you know, published first, you know, paper um, publicly articulating the fact that, that this was a possibility. But again, no one had done this uh, successfully in practice. And then actually, at the very end of 2016, at the beginning of 2017, there were actually two papers that appeared that started to use this kind of 3D proximity data in practice to assemble genomes. Um, a paper uh, in, in Nature, and then a paper in, uh, in, on, on Xenopus, uh, and then another, another Nature paper on the barley genome. But what I want to highlight is that they were using 3D information, but they were using many other kinds of information as well. So they were using paired end data, mate pair data, phosmids, backs, right, fish experiments, optical mapping, you know, linkage mapping, all kinds of data sets. We're talking about millions of dollars worth of data that went into this. And, and it included some 3D data, but it was one of, it was one ingredient uh, in a huge mix of, of ingredients. 
So these were important steps forward, but they still didn't quite show this notion that you could take a huge number of puzzle pieces and then use purely 3D information to assemble them. So we asked ourselves, why didn't this work? Uh, why wasn't this working terribly well, right? People had articulated this idea. Why wasn't it working terribly well? And, and you know, what were we kind of working on when we were trying to get this, this to work? One of the issues is that, in general, when you assemble genomes, the contigs that are produced are just too short. Um, and that's a huge problem, because the 3D assemblers uh, that existed wouldn't work well with short contigs. The other big issue is the contigs were too wrong. They had mistakes. And the 3D assemblers would be very, very unhappy in the context of mistakes. So I just wanted to give you an example. Here's a bunch of short reads, and we took sort of the, a standard 3D assembler uh, and tried to assemble them to chromosome-like scaffolds, and then here's a dot plot, you know, versus the correct answer. So if, if you're doing it perfectly, you'll just get a diagonal line from the lower left to the upper right. Um, and you can see that this is kind of a disaster. It's just not assembling at all. Because if you just take short reads and you produce the standard short contigs from them, uh, it just none of these 3D assemblers will work. Um, so we worked very hard on the algorithms that I just don't have time in, in such a short talk to get into details uh, of, of the algorithms. But we uh, made a whole bunch of dramatic improvements to these algorithms. So when we take short reads, they actually assemble from one end to the other and put things in the right order. Uh, here we're zooming in on chromosome one, uh, and you can see it's put chromosome one in nearly, uh, nearly exactly the right order. Um, and indeed, it's put every chromosome in exactly the right order. So this is, I want to highlight that what you're looking at here is an algorithm. It's being run in about $8,000 worth of short read data, and it's being compared to HG38, the standard human reference genome, and it has produced chromosome length scaffolds that are pretty much, pretty much exactly right. Still, there's a few mistakes here, right? And indeed, when, if you look, you know, across these genomes, you'll see a few, a few mistakes that we're producing. And why are those mistakes coming in? Well, it turns out that when contigers, these software packages that are used to overlap, uh, tile the reads and make contigs, they actually tend to make errors from time to time. And even if they make very few errors, those errors have catastrophic results. So for instance, here you can see with perfect contigs, we run our assembler, and then you get these beautiful 23 human chromosomes. But what we did here is uh, we actually took a draft that had essentially one error, right? And you can see all of a sudden this chromosome didn't assemble. Like a whole bunch of these chromosomes, they're a mess. This is actually one of the nice things about these 3D maps, right? You just see beautiful squares along the diagonal, you know it's been assembled well, right? If it looks like a big mess there, you know that there's a problem, right? Because real chromosomes don't look like that. Real chromosomes look like squares in these maps. So let's, let's zoom in over here and see actually what went wrong. So if you, look at, if you look at what went wrong, there was a contig generated that looked like this. Right, so this is actually was, you know, the, the contig data suggested that this was a contiguous sequence. What you can see is that one chunk of the sequence is forming lots of contacts with itself. Another chunk of the sequence is forming lots of contacts with itself. But these two chunks of the sequence rarely form contacts with one another. This is kind of like this guy never talks to his next door neighbor, never talks to the guy two do doors down. It's completely unrealistic. This is something that never, ever, ever happens in reality. So we knew when we looked at this that this was a misjoin, that the contiger had made errors. So one of the things that we actually did is we built an assembler that automatically detects and corrects these errors in real time. Because you can see using the 3D data, you can detect and correct these errors in real time. Uh, so, for instance, in this particular case, you see this huge, sharp drop-off, right, these four-quadrant sort of motif, and then we knew, okay, there must be an error there. We automatically annotate these errors, and all of a sudden, you can see that with the exception of this inversion on chromosome 17, we assemble an essentially perfect genome. And we're talking about, again, seven, $8,000 worth of short-read data um, to do this. Um, and it's really, it's all in the computation, it's all in the algorithms, it's all in the analysis. Uh, in this particular case, I want to highlight that we actually started with about 100,000 short pieces uh, in the genome. We only added $600 worth of 3D sequencing data, and we were able to produce the 23 huge scaffolds that were essentially perfect. I want to highlight that this genome is as close to HG38, the current human reference, as the original draft genome published by the Human Genome Consortium was to the reference. Right? The Human Genome Consortium, uh, right, that was a $3 billion effort. This is something that we can now do pretty routinely for about $10,000 worth of sequencing and then a lot of computational effort. Okay, so I want to tell you a little bit more about how we've been applying this. One challenge, and we were kind of working on improving these algorithms, and then, you know, we reached a point where we, we couldn't, we felt that we couldn't just keep doing this in stealth mode, uh, because the New York Times published this article where they showed the genome of Aedes aegypti, and they said no one knows how to assemble Aedes aegypti, but it's a principal vector for the Zika virus, so we need to figure it out. And they actually showed all of the contigs and how people couldn't put them together. Um, 
Indeed, if you take a standard 3D assembler and you take uh, and you attempt to assemble this and you compare to a linkage map in this particular case, so if you have a monotonic increase, uh, you can just get a disaster. It fails to assemble at all. When we put it through our assembler, um, it's totally not monotonic. When we put it through our assembler, it matched the linkage map beautifully. In point of fact, you can see that what we start with is this kind of motif. You can see you don't see those nice chromosome squares. In fact, it just looks like kind of a QR code. Tells you that you've got little chunks of genome that are correct, but on the whole, they're not ordered or oriented at all. Once you run it through our algorithms, it produces three beautiful chromosome length scaffolds. So we're able to in assemble the entirety of the mosquito genome. Uh, we did actually West Nile virus next, just to show that we could. Uh, again, it was about $1,000 to do this worth of sequencing data, about $1,000 worth of this uh, worth of sequencing data here, and then a lot of computational analysis. You could actually start to see mosquito evolution at chromosome scale, because now we had three chromosome length mosquitoes, mosquito genomes, the two that we had published, um, and, uh, and Adopheles gambiae, the malaria genome. And one of the things that's nice, and here, Aedes aegypti, which is a vector for Zika, Right, we're coloring in the chromosome arms in particular colors, so there's a purple arm, a brown arm, a green arm, a blue arm, et cetera. What you can see is that over the, the, over the 150 million years of mosquito evolution, uh, although the arms have expanded, their general contents are being preserved. So for instance, the purple arm in Anopheles gambiae, which diverged from Aedes aegypti 150 million years ago, those, the things that are in the same, cro same chromosome arm in Anopheles gambiae are still in the same chromosome arm in Culex incapaciatus. They're still in the same chromosome arm in Aedes aegypti, right? So within the chromosome arms, you can see that there's a lot of scrambling going on, but things don't move from one arm to another. See, the green arm is beautifully preserved. The blue arm is preserved all the way out to Drosophila melanogaster. That's a quarter of a billion years of evolution, yet the context, contents of this arm remain intact. There are some arm exchange events. So for instance, blue and green go together in Aedes aegypti, um, yellow and red uh, in Aedes aegypti. If you look in Culex incapaciatus, there's an arm exchange event, so it's green and yellow together, blue and red together. What you can see is this you know, untold history of the evolution of, of these species. Um, so I want to highlight, we can now assemble any kind of DNA seq data currently available, Lumina, PacBio, Sanger, you throw in some high c uh, and a lot of uh, algorithms and computational analyses, and you get chromosome scale scaffolds. This is actually really cheap, it's worked every time so far, uh, and if you have genomes, you can talk to us. So one of the big questions that we, uh, uh, and I want to highlight that this science paper, right, I mean, there's a genome assembly paper, remember the very first, you know, big genome assembly papers that appeared in Nature and Science cost $3 billion. This paper cost us less than $2,000 worth of sequence data. It was all algorithms and computation um, to assemble these two mosquito genomes. So we said, what are some of the things that we want to work on? And actually, around this time, uh, we were at this stage, I, I met Rajiv uh, at a conference in China, and I was just so excited about uh, the work that was happening at ICRASAT um, and all of the urgent, um, all of the ways in which, you know, we could translate these kinds of ideas to actually help uh, in the world of, of crop genomes, to help um, serve uh, communities that could really benefit from, from genomics, but weren't necessarily benefiting from genomics. Uh, and so we set up a, uh, a partnership to try to look at um, crop genomes together. And I just want to report in the final minutes a, a little bit of the progress that we've, that we've made. So basic question is, I've shown you some different animals, but can we do plants? The answer is yes, we can do plants. Here is an example. This is par with uh, Parwinder Cower we did this. This is the subterranean clover. You can see tiny, tiny, tiny little contigs. Right, the whole genome's a mess, big QR code thing, assembles beautifully. So he said, okay, we think we can do this. So I talked to Rajiv, and Rajiv said, okay, let's send you some samples. So let me show you some examples. Here's the pigeon pea, right? And I have to say, I mean, I, I really admire uh, Rajiv greatly, because most people, when they finish, you know, when they write the paper, then the story is done. But Rajiv recognized that there was really an opportunity here to go far, far beyond what people were typically doing with genomes and actually produce chromosome length scaffolds, produce things that were similar to what the International Human Genome Project produced. Uh, so I was very, very excited to work with him about it. So you see pigeon pea, right, it had relatively short context. This is typical of a relatively high quality genome um, in, you know, 2016, 2017, looks like this. But you can see that when you add in that high C data, you can deconvolve all of the chromosomes very beautifully. And I want to highlight actually, Right, if you look at these linkage groups, right, they're, they're kind of a, a bit messy, right, but they, you know, break down into chromosomes very, very beautifully after the high C. Uh, we were able to repeat that with tetraploid peanut. Um, you can see again, start with this kind of QR code, you end up with these beautiful chromosomes. Um, 
And uh, actually, just this weekend, uh, we were very, very pleased to be able to email um, Rajiv a link to uh, the improved chickpea. Um, and uh, you can see it actually started with pretty, you know, pretty good start on the chromosomes. We were able to dramatically extend the chromosomes, get into this whole QR region that hadn't been assembled very well. Assemble it better, correct some errors over there, uh, and we were in good shape. And I just want to highlight what we're actually able to do in terms of improving these genomes. So with peanut, we started with nearly 4,000 scaffolds. We took it down to 20 chromosomes. With pigeon pea, we started with about 36,000 uh, scaffolds, little chunks of genome, put it into 11 chromosomes. With chickpea, about 7,000, put it into eight chromosomes. And we are currently working, actually, on both the, the A and B ancestors of, uh, of the ground nuts. So we're, we're confident that we'll be able to do those as well. And, you know, we're hoping to do many, many other, uh, you know, crops together with Icrasat. I think, you know, as I've been at this conference, I'm already learning about the amazing 10-year history of what Icrasat has accomplished uh, already. I think we're late entrance into that mix, but I hope that we will have uh, many opportunities to work together uh, at the forefront of uh, genome assembly uh, together with Rajiv and this entire community in the 10 years to come. Finally, I want to highlight that the assembly project in my lab is led by an incredibly talented postdoc, Olga Dudchenko. Uh, all of these team members actually contributed to the work uh, that I am uh, describing to you today. I also want to highlight our funders, the ENCODE project, Google, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Director's New Innovator Award, the 40 Nucleome Consortium, and many, many others. Finally, I want to thank you guys for your time and attention. Thank you so much. So you, you've shown fabulous results for structural genomics, but I'm, I'm wondering, can you start to use Hi-C to interrogate chromosomes dynamically, such as during meiosis, to look at how different parts of different chromosomes can come together, maybe in small numbers of cells over, over, over precise time periods? Absolutely. Uh, you certainly can. And I mean, I, I didn't, I decided I, I really was just so excited about what we've been doing uh, together with Rajiv that I wanted to focus on that in this talk. But actually, you know, just, just a couple, about two months ago, we had a paper on the cover of Cell where we actually created not just, you know, looking at kind of abstract time points, but even over the course of an hour, we were able to basically uh, remove a protein and then reintroduce it to a cell over the course of an hour and literally watch minute by minute um, as the uh, genome fold changed. Uh, over time, so you can really track with uh, with exquisite power uh, some of the biochemical underpinnings uh, of the folding process. Yeah, you've got a beautiful method there for, for scaffolding and also identifying um, pontigs, which are chimeric. Another major issue with genome assemblies, particularly highly repetitive crop genomes, is that the initial draft will have many collapsed contigs to have a single representation where it should be present multiple times in the genome. Um, are you resolving these as well? Absolutely. And this is actually, um, so I would say there are, you know, th things within our pipeline graduate to different levels of stability at which point we start releasing tools. Um, those are some of the trickiest issues. I would say right now where the frontier of what's being codified into stable tools that we publicly release uh, lives right now, it kind of merges. So when we have underclass heterozygosity, for instance, in the draft, um, then, you know, we can pretty reliably merge that, even if it's a pretty bad scenario, using um, code, kind of, you know, pretty well-baked code. Uh, but the flip side, which you highlight in plants, and which, I mean, it's a tremendously important point because it's something we're really seeing in plants much more than other contexts. You'll have, like, many different copies of a single context. That's really tricky. In general, the answer is that, yes, we can very frequently resolve those pretty decisively. Um, however, uh, I want to highlight that that, in, that is actually a fairly involved process. So, you know, and we've been looking at some of these cases, actually in some of these cases, in, in, uh, this has arise, uh, arisen as well, and it really takes, you know, a team of people doing analyses that are actually pretty specific for that particular genome to say, okay, now we've figured out what the signature is. Um, but, you know, it, it opens up actually some really beautiful, uh, beautiful results uh, as well. It opens up, I think, some, some beautiful opportunities. Thank you again, Dr. Adam. Very interesting job.